and I saw one aircraft carry on fire as I was uh, going to my battle station. The stem of the destroyer just passed our floater net, and I was looking straight up at the bridge, at, uh, and pretty soon I'm underwater, and then, <laughs> then you're thinking, well, here come those screws, are gonna be chomp, 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 and we're gonna get chewed up pretty good. You could hear the metal ripping like that when the shells had hit. She caught, and she started burning, and the lead paint, and I thought the Japs were using poison gas on us, and it was the smell of the lead paint, and you couldn't breathe. And boy, I needed air, and I had to get out of there now, you know. The, the, the fantail went down first. I, I, I go, and just, and, it, and when it went down, it just went straight down. Looked over here and I saw my buddy, uh, Penny Watch, and uh, my cook, blood running out of the nose, so I figured they were dead. Sixty-three years ago, the men of the destroyer, known as the USS Hull, entered into battle against the Japanese in the Leyte Gulf near the island of Samar. At the time, they were part of a large fleet known as Taffy 3. Little did these sailors know then that this battle would shape them for the rest of their lives. Who were these men, and why were they there? These are just some of the questions that the men of the USS Hull discussed with the documentary crew from Petersburg High School in October of 2007 in Tucson, Arizona. Every year, the men of the USS Hull get together to commemorate those fateful days in 1944. The reunion brings together men from all over the country, from California and Alabama, from Michigan and Kentucky, from North Carolina and Alaska. These World War II veterans come from all walks of life and yet have something very much in common, the events of October 25th, 1944. The story of the USS Hull began late in the second year of World War II, as many of its future occupants were still finishing high school. As the civilian workforce prepared the ship for action, the Navy was busy preparing its fighting force for action as well. Some men were drafted, while others enlisted. I heard a rumor that they were not going to let people enlist in the Navy anymore they were just going to draft them and put them wherever. Uh, I would have been drafted in the next month. So, so consequently, I volunteered for the Navy. Well, the recruiting office, we find out they lie to you a little bit because they said, this is what's going to win the war. All you guys joining the Navy together, you're going to have a ball. You're going to go see the world. And uh, they'll keep you all together. Well. We were all sworn in together. We went to a basic training together in San Diego. To finish a basic training, they put us on a bus and their trucks and they took us over to Balboa Park. Balboa Park, they started calling the roll. Everybody uh, disappeared. One buddy went this way, another one went the other way. That's the last I saw of them. I only saw one guy during the war and uh, two of them got killed. And so we found out that they lied to us a little bit. These men set out for training locations all over the United States. Places like San Diego, the Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago, and Farragut, Idaho. Yes, even landlocked Farragut, Idaho. Farragut, Idaho, Camp Hill. Farragut, Idaho, <laughs> well, uh, it's winter time, very cold, and ice all around. Well, I just arrived across from Hawaii with my butt very thin and it arrived at Farragut at 30 degrees below zero. The snow was a little fluffy snow up to my waist when we stepped off the train there. We arrived sometime around midnight. I had on a low shirt, <laughs> socks and shoes and not properly cold for that type of climate. 
So we got into, you know, they, I don't remember how many barracks they had there. They were two-story barracks, and each company was on one floor. They had on the big barracks, and we were in the upper deck, and um, the company, 74, and on one side the barracks, they lifted all the windows up, and the other side to put all the top side windows down. So you had a nice gale going through there. And from guys just spitting up phlegm out of the window, it was about six feet around the outside of the snow it was yellow. <laughs> The future crew of the USS Hull began to work their way to San Francisco, where they would see their ship for the first time. Many of them would be called plank owners. Still others would arrive after she was commissioned. And uh, that then was assigned to the USS Hull before it was commissioned. And the whole detail, which was in Treasure Island, and we went from Treasure Island by bus, took us over there, and put us over the side, and uh, it was dry docked, and we was wire brushing. The crew wire brushed the bottom of the ship uh, so they could put the red lead on the bottom of the ship. Then we went to these different schools, like firefighting school and gunnery school. And, oh. I was amazed at the, such a beautiful ship that it was the biggest boat that I'd seen, that's for sure. And, and by a comparison with other uh, ships that the Navy had, it wasn't very large. It was rather small, as a matter of fact. After the original crew was assembled, the Navy commissioned the USS Hull on August 16, 1943. In a simple ceremony, the ship and crew were placed in the hands of the original commanding officer, Captain William Thomas. Well, he was, I would say, he's uh, kind of aloof, you know. I mean, he was just, he's a quiet man. He was, Captain Thomas was a very good man. He had good training. He was a very reserved setback. When I first met Captain Thomas, he had a very stern look on his face, but a twinkle in his eye, and I knew I had boarded a good ship. He had good officers. They understood the crew real good, and they were really good to us. Captain Thomas was, was a wonderful skipper, and uh, <coughs> so was Kent Berger. When Kent Berger came aboard, he was like a, a, a father or a grandfather to us. Once the ship was commissioned, she was put through her first paces, known as the Shakedown Cruise. We went on a Shakedown Cruise to San Diego and back again. When we got down to San Diego, uh, I was back and had food down the aft quarters, and we had, they had a subcontact. And uh, they started dropping these depth charges off the stern of the ship. The light bulbs started busting. They must have sent them for 30 foot depth or something shallow. And, and they're uh, as soon as those start going off, you can, you, you can tell on the, on the bottom of the ship. And of course, I was, I was topside in a few seconds. The only thing I remember was one of the shipmates who had been in some action before that. And he, I don't know if his hearing had been damaged or what have you, but he couldn't stand it when we were firing. And he'd go hide. And so he had to put up with it till we got back to San Francisco. Then they moved him off the ship on, into a hospital or whatever. Well, I, along with many others, got seasick. But I finally I got accustomed to it and, and uh, never bothered me thereafter. By October of 1943, the USS Hull was ready for the high seas and soon left the safety of the United States mainland, bound for Pearl Harbor never to return. Even during time of war, the U.S. Navy still observes a time-honored tradition of celebrating crossing the equator. This celebration is a rite of passage that involves the initiation of those first-time crossers. 
it was it was it was an interesting experience. But the Pollywog is uh, committed to crime. I was to be punished because I was a Hollywood Lutheran. Uh, some people that had no hair were accused of having too much hair, you know. <laughs> they have all different kind of crazy charges like that where uh, <laughs> the court <laughs> convicted you. <laughs> of course, you had to go through water lines. Uh, they uh, uh, burn your butt with water. <laughs> then you start off, and the first thing I do, they start hitting you with um, shillelaghs. The thing like a windsock that was pretty big around with garbage in it. You had to crawl through that, and then they could hit you with a paddle when you were. And you had diesel oil and uh, fat that's been soaked in diesel oil tied on a string, and you swallow it, and about you get it about there, it just starts to swallow, and in fact, they pull it up. <laughs> and that's kind of nasty. You got a nasty taste in yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, they had one big fat guy, and they had oil all over his stomach, and, and probably other. Uh, 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 other substances that were just as distasteful as all, and you had to kiss his belly. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one thing I remember that I certainly did not like. Then they stick you in the, with a fanny with a charged sword, and it's got electrical charge to it. And man, you're just flat out. I mean, and just about on the deck, you're, you're out, and the next thing they poke you that, you're laying out flat. And, and then you try to get up on your hands and knees to get up, and they touch you again, and you're, you're back out flat. And they do that about three times, so you just, you, you quit, you quit, you just lay there. No, I think everybody, it's a part of the uh, process, so I, uh, I, I'm, I didn't see anybody rebel against it. Of course, it wouldn't have made any difference. They would have ignored that and done it anyway, so. The USS Hull left Pearl Harbor as part of the destroyer squadron that was sent to Tarawa to help prepare the small island for the impending invasion by the United States Marine Corps. Tarawa seems to stand out in the minds of many of the Hull survivors because of several events that occur. It was at Tarawa that most of the men of the USS Hull witnessed their first major naval catastrophe when the escort carrier Liscombe Bay was torpedoed. And, and one of the carriers um, that was called the Liscombe Bay uh, was torpedoed by Japanese. Well, I happened to be topside at that time and it was an ex a sight you would never forget. And he went straight up in the air and straight down. And uh, the thing, the plane and the explosion must have put 1,800 feet in the air. I mean, it was a tremendous explosion. I started uh, getting scared. <laughs> Just under 300 sailors from the Liscombe Bay were eventually rescued, but tragically, 640 sailors died as a result of the attack. Tarawa was also memorable for another reason. As part of an anti-submarine sweep, the hull ran aground on an uncharted reef. Uncharted waters, those islands was mandated islands given to Japan after World War I, and coral grows very rapidly, and we hadn't charted those waters, so we had no idea how the depth of water there, and we were screening the Pennsylvania, battleship Pennsylvania. We were racing around the island, and we ran aground and put our bow nice and I think 11 feet out of the water. So then they they waited till it was close to high water and they they tried to uh, get it off and it wouldn't go off and so they were just in the process of maybe throwing the ammunition overboard when what they did is they just moved the ammunition forward and then they got her off of there. The damage done to the ship forced it out of action for the remainder of 1943, and it had to limp back to Pearl Harbor for repairs, which put the sailors there for Christmas. As America rang in the new year, 1944, Japan's three-year grip on the Pacific was beginning to diminish. The hull was put back into action and was sent to the Marshall Islands for the campaign there in late January 1944. 
after the repairs and we went to the, uh, spent Christmas there and then went to Marshall Island campaign. We started off with Kowajlan and did bombardment on the Kwajalein Island. Kwajalein, and then we went to Inuitok, and then in February we went to uh, the Peleliu, New Hanover, and uh, then on to the Philippines. Their job at Kwajalein was multi-pronged, including escorting the carriers, picket, and gunfire support. The fire support that the hole gave was important in preparing the beaches for the invasion. The hole's guns destroyed Japanese military crafts on the island, as well as pillboxes and troop concentrations. Each of these campaigns brought the hole closer and closer to the Japanese stronghold of the Philippines. As the Allies worked their way across the island's speckled South Pacific, they ran straight into an enemy, hell-bent on defending its territory. This is Tavang when we went and destroyed the base there. And when they ran out of targets there, there was a church on the top of the hill, a white church. <laughs> they got to take it out. And boy, they hit a direct hit. That church was the biggest exposed medicine. And Thomas stuck his head out from the bridge and kept tossing, Good call, Miranda. We got the ammo dump. Use the church for the ammo supply, and I, I thought some kind of instinct told me that wasn't right. Not the Japanese there, they wouldn't man, need a church, you know. So I said, oh, God forgives me for avoiding this church up. But, and the others, we fired phosphorus. Well, that, that's a wicked thing. No, that should never be used in the war. It burns your body. And fired into their barracks, and they can run out of barracks there with hugs of phosphorus against the bus, gets into the skin, so it starts burning, and they run, scream, jump in the water, and of course, it stops with the water. They come out of the water, it starts burning again. That's the wicked thing. One incident that still stands out today in the minds of many of the whole survivors involved a canoe. At the time, it did not seem like such an important event, but later in the war, the memory of the event would flood into the minds of many of the sailors. Just before it got daylight there, we had uh, picked up, I, I heard, uh, I thought it like a tractor there, and I got on the corner, I was going to look at it, and said, there's, there's a tractor out there. I hear, there's a Jap submarine on the surface charging his battery, so diesel engine. The submarine was coming to pick up those guys, there's still all of 23 Jap officers on there, and they were in a canoe and they had a Davis machine gun that they got one from Singapore or Burma, and it was a British machine gun, and on a, in a dugout canoe. And they started firing at a destroyer with a machine gun there. So we opened up 20 millimeters to 40 millimeters. Got him. And then when they got up close there, that there. Then I tell you, to this day, I'm working over the road that there, and here's the gap opened up. The, I'd have been screaming bloody murder. They didn't utter a sound. <laughs> Killed every one of them. By October 1944, the sailors learned of their next engagement. It would come in the Leyte Gulf, off the island of Samar. As part of the Third Fleet, under the control of Admiral Bull Halsey, the destroyers of Taffy III were assigned to screening duty there at Leyte. It was at this time that the command of the USS Hull shifted from Captain Thomas to Captain Kintberger. Captain Thomas was promoted to Commodore and was placed in charge of Taffy 3's screening fleet. He chose to keep the Hull as his flagship. Uh, we had a new skipper uh, when we left Manus to go to a lady and he came back to the, and sat down with the crew back aft and he told the crew what our mission was to be. And our mission was to be, uh, have carriers. At that time, we only had four. And our primary mission was to be uh, screen for them, which is uh, seeking for subs, you know, detecting with sonar gear. And then from uh, uh, any air, or from aircraft that might be coming in.
As the fleet steamed towards Leyte Gulf, they ran headlong into a massive typhoon. Not realizing the danger that a typhoon posed to objects in her way, several young sailors strayed onto deck to get their food that was stowed there. Others went onto deck to secure objects that were loose. We were in danger and I didn't even realize it. It blew 120 miles an hour. And I, and I marvel now at the fact that uh, they were able to keep the bow of that ship into the wind in order to keep from being hit uh, uh, either flush on the starboard uh, uh, or, or, the, or the other, other leeward side, you know. And when we went on an invasion like that, we had all kinds of stores, more stores than we could get below decks and what have you. And uh, like, well, apples and potatoes and what have you came in wooden crates. So outside the galley, on the deck house wall. They used to lash these things. Well, some of them, they broke loose and what have you. And they really didn't have any lines to secure things that weren't just like clothesline and then the next thing was a hawser, you know. So we went out there and we got most of them boxes secured. The typhoon, with its driving wind and rain, pushed waves over the bow. This storm would spread sheets of water over the bridge and wash clear to the fantail. The water was sheets of water coming up over the mast. I mean, and that's how high it is. The uh, bow of that ship would disappear. I mean, just disappear, covered in water, and it would come back up again. We started through this narrow opening, and the ship took a big dive, and, and a big swell come on board, and we just swept us right through that opening. And so I kind of thought that maybe things were coming to an, <laughs> to an end, but as, as it happened, right after there, there was a, a, well, there was two 20s, and they had a shield around them like this, and, you know, for shrapnel or what have you. And, uh, we ended up there, and when I finally realized what's going on, I was going around and around in there like in a washing machine. <laughs> and all the, the destroyers and all, you're half time, you're underwater, half time, you're in the air. And you could look, there the ships going on there, the Johnson going on there, and the bow, and the stern, would be in the water, in a wave, and you could look run underneath her. Where it's like being dropped in the pink side of a ping pong ball, right? dropped into a washing machine on the, on the full rinse cycle or the high wash cycle because you don't know where that ship's going to go next and it's, it's very frightening. It was said by the Navy that a Fletcher class destroyer would capsize when rolled 65 degrees. Well, the biggest one we was in, uh, I thought the ship was going to capsize. He could roll over, then he'd roll back. Then it could go up, in two minutes it'd hit down. We took a 57 degree list. They say one destroyer ran out of fuel and turned sideways in a trough and capsized. There were three destroyers that broke in half. And I don't know if other ships picked them up or I don't see how they could because, you know, this the water is. Uh, I, uh, I, I just thought that. Uh, uh, those ships would not sink, you know. That's all there is to it. I just uh, it never occurred to me that uh, it would be possible for them to capsize. This typhoon would be an ominous foreshadow of the impending battle the men of the hull were sailing into. October 25th, 1944 began like any other day aboard a Navy destroyer at war early general quarters. The early morning dawn was a prime time for enemy subs as the silhouettes of the ship were illumined with the morning light. But this Wednesday was to be much different than a normal morning. As general quarters were secured, the men who were not on watch went to breakfast or returned to their bunks. I was on watch. I was on the uh, watch at four to eight watch. So I was on watch that morning. And I was, uh, had the headphones on. It was, 
Faulkner came down and said, the whole Jap fleet's out there. We said, boy, and I rolled over to my sack. And I, I noticed first, uh, back there, you know, you're fighting. Usually when you're at the fan day, you're always looking aft anyway. Uh, just around, but uh, then I noticed flak in the air and that, uh, at a plane. And of course, I, I just, I couldn't make it out, it wasn't part of our group. I, I didn't know that it wasn't an American plane. It was now obvious that the battle for Leyte Gulf had begun. The men of the hull were immediately ordered to general quarters again for the second time that morning. It would be the last time the hull would be ordered to general quarters. About 6.35, we were, most of us were lined up for chow for breakfast and for the chow line. General quarters, General quarters, all hands man your battle stations, all hands man your battle stations. And uh, they sounded the GQ alarm, which you, once you hear it, you never forget it, and it gets to you and you start moving. I was in my bunk, and uh, uh, when they sounded General quarters, where I bunked was in the after compartment, and I don't know why, why I hadn't gone to breakfast, but I was down there. I was in the chow line on the port side, and uh, when it sounded general quarters, and everybody took off. And <laughs> then the uh, uh, next thing we knew that uh, I heard the skipper come over, and of course they sounded general quarters, and then a, a skipper came on and said, small boys fall in on us. Well, I came up and uh, just as I came up and stepped out onto the deck, I saw a salvo straddle the uh, battleship. Well, that wasn't the battleship, it was, uh, it was one of the uh, aircraft carriers, one of those flat tops. And I saw one aircraft carrier on fire as I was uh, going to my battle station. Uh, I knew then, when I saw that, I knew that uh, that, that uh, call to general quarters meant that uh, we were in business. My battle station was two decks down from the, well, one deck down from the IC room where I normally had stood watch. But uh, this particular time there was a guy that got sick and the uh, electrician's mate got sick and was transferred off the ship for uh, moved me down to the diesel generator room which was one deck further down, one way in and one way out and it had a big diesel generator in there with a switchboard across the one end of it. And it had an emergency power to all the turrets and all the critical electrical circuits that they had on the ship. For the first time in the short history of the whole, a battle was more than just softening up the beaches or protecting convoys. This was personal. The ship, home for over 350 men, was under attack in that room all alone and 19 years old and uh, scared to death and I put on my sound powered phones and, uh, and they started saying what was out there because this circuit's a good, all the guys on the circuit can hear it. And the whole Japanese fleet's out there and wow. Yeah. At a time like that, you really don't do much thinking. You react. It just seems like it's, it's something that's happening that shouldn't be happening, really. It's just, uh, it's an experience that, uh, that's difficult to describe. All hands were now at their battle stations. The men were fighting for their ship and their lives. The mighty Japanese Navy that had been out of sight when the first shells began to appear was now visible on the horizon with their familiar pagoda-shaped masts drawing closer and closer. The horrifying flash of the guns could be seen, but an eternity would seem to pass before the loud crack of the guns could be heard. Captain Kintberger quickly ordered his men to lay smokescreen so that the carriers would not be seen. At the same time, the gun batteries were firing at the rapidly approaching enemy. And about that time, uh, I was only a striker. I turned the headphones over to uh, the third class petty officer. And uh, then he gave me the order to make smoke on the uh, starboard to open the valves on the starboard generator and, while well, he was opening over on the uh, port side. And then uh, 
we laid the smoke and covered up the carriers at flank. And of course, we were at flank speed. I got there down to the bar station there, and the first thing there, and started up, and started passing shells up. It was, it was, we almost started almost immediately set firing. My first indication, we were at. The, I knew when we were going at flank speed, and uh, uh, you know, something was up, but I couldn't see where the, where the shells were coming from. The hole was now at flank speed, which is over 35 knots, laying down the necessary smoke to protect the carriers. All along, the Japanese were zeroing in on their targets with different color range markers. I see the Japanese, they go shooting these uh, colored flares or bombs or whatever. They kept shooting them and getting closer. The carrier that was right just to the short ahead of us and to our starboard side. The shells were splashing behind it, large shells. They came end over end. I, you know, it just, I didn't know where they're coming from. We, they, we were firing at us from over the horizon, but they made a heck of a wop wop sound as they were spent, fortunately, and then hit the water and these guys in the water going up. There was a shell that hit us with green dye in it, with dye markers that the Japs used to see whether they were over or under or what, you know. And, and when it hit us, I remember this green cloud drifting down the side of the ship there, and I thought, oh, the guys, are, they're bastards are trying to, to uh, gas us. But that wasn't the case. After nearly 30 minutes of battle, a brief but welcome rain squall ran across the battle area, which provided its own natural screen protection for the destroyers. And then we headed into the rain squall. That's where we were heading. And of course, the carriers were trying to get their planes off. It was a sigh of relief, I tell you. Yeah, you felt, you felt relief because all these shells are coming flying around, and by that time, they're they're coming alongside us, you know, splashing around. And when you go in the rain squall, it stopped. But we were in the rain squall for about 10 minutes. That gave you a sigh of relief. And in the meantime, while we were doing it, we were trying to wire up the depth charges to put them on safe. While in the rain squall, the hull was able to quickly prepare itself for an offensive assault on the Japanese fleet. The cloud cover lasted for about 10 minutes. And as it began to pass, the hole made a turn towards the enemy and readied itself for launching torpedoes. Commander Thomas, the screen commander, was on, on our ship. And uh, when he gave the order to attack, of course, we turned. We turn around and we're making flank speed. I'd say within an hour, uh, almost an hour's time, they would make a torpedo run and come back. We came to the smoke screen twice. The first time we were okay. The second time we took, got our first, started getting our first hits. Well, we were zigzagging uh, and laying spoke screens uh, to try to avoid uh, being hit as best we could. This dangerous turn back towards the enemy put the hole in the direct line of fire. And as the ship moved out of the squall and into the open, the Japanese finally zeroed in on their target. At 7.25 in the morning, Nearly one hour into the battle, the hole was hit by the first major projectile. The shell exploded near the bridge, wounding Commodore Thomas and others. I rapidly learned that there's something going on up topside, plus the fact our guns were firing. Up, uh, the number two five-inch gun was right on the main deck above where the diesel generator room was located, and could feel it and hear it uh, going off. Yeah, we were making we made the torpedo run, and they fired the first five fish at at the uh, and then of course as we come out broadside uh, after going into the battle wagon, he come out. Uh, then we took some hit in, in one of the fire rooms, and, and uh, we lost our power. When he got hit, we lost electrical power. So uh, we uh, 
had to uh, load by hand, manual loading. You had no hydraulics. And then about the time we started taking hits, well, the ship would go up and then shake like the bulldog had it, drop it back down in the water. Well, so when we started taking hits, we, I felt this way, that ship would just shudder. And we took over 40 major caliber hits. The Japanese Navy now unloaded its fierce firepower on the vulnerable destroyer, causing all hell to break loose aboard the ship. And uh, we lost our power and lost our after uh, steering. Uh, we didn't lose after steering. Uh, from the bridge, we lost communication. And so they sent the crew back. I we were actually heading, uh, heading out, and of course they really unloaded us, and I could see that then, you know, that's... We sustained a hit just, just beyond the gun, the 40 millimeter that I was on. Steam went everywhere. And finally I reached down for a shell like that there, and a ball of fire hit me in the face. And I just dogged the hatch down and said a prayer for the three guys in the magazine. They, we took the direct hit in the magazine, number one magazine. You couldn't see your hands in front of your face. And I guess the two things that I remember about that was, the kid was the loader on the other side. When the steam cleared away, he was gone. I never saw him again. And nobody on the ship that I ever talked to who survived ever knew what happened to him. And uh, where he went, of course, I'll never know. I, I know Bob Despain and I were laying in, our, in the blood and flesh of our ship. And the gun captain, he was a, a young fellow from uh, Minnesota. His name was Drager. Uh, apparently he was just, he was cooked alive by that, uh, by that steam because we later buried him at sea uh, on the, from the raft that I was on. After one hour of battle, the hull was reduced down to just its starboard engine. Its steering had to be converted over to manual due to the damage done. In addition, its main gun batteries were sustaining damage. And we fought, uh, well, I say three fourths of the battle, at least, was fought and fired all manually. The barrel um, was blown off gun four, and you could hear it. And you know, you don't just turn around and go. He's, he's they're also trying to steer away from uh, other shell splashes. So you're, you're, you're going, uh, to starboard one minute, and then the next minute you're going, he's going to port, and you're, back, you're going back and forth. You can hear that barrel was rolling across the deck all the time it was blowing off. You could hear the metal ripping like that when the shells had hit. I could look out the port side or the starboard side of the ship, ship shell and see the moon, uh, sky, water, see the clouds. They had blown too many holes in the ship, but we still went on. It didn't stop. Tiny Hendrix, the one that wound up, found all of us survivors for the first reunion there, he uh, had some mattresses and some timbers, and there was a hole in the mess. All water was always splashing. Heck, he could have driven a car, two cars side by side in that big hole there. And here's Tiny trying to save the ship. Help me, Miranda, shore this up. Three, we have gun three, which is another five inch. And they took hits and the steam was coming up from, from down below. And so they had to evacuate gun number three. So you lost all three guns that was capable of firing under the rear. So from then on, you only had number one and two when I'm talking about five inch guns. And she started burning, and the lead paint, and I thought the Japs were using poison gas on us, and it was the smell of the lead paint, and you couldn't breathe. And boy, I needed air, and I had to get out of there now, you know. The men up top on the hull could see just how bad things were getting. 
the casualties were beginning to mount. As bad as it was on deck, the men below were in a fight for their lives. Then this pastor the abandoned ship. And that is when the scare hit me, because I can't swim. Well, I got on it when they took a hit in the forward fire room, which was the next bulkhead uh, next to the diesel generator room. And we took a major salvo in there that blew the bulkhead in, which blew the switchboard on, it would have landed on top of me, except for the diesel generator room. It fell on back onto the diesel generator and I was knocked to the ground. And I figured it's time to get the hell out of here, so. We went down through the chief's quarters and to the mess hall, up the starboard ladder there, and I was up the ladder there, and opened the hatch, and I pushed, pushed, I couldn't open it. And I finally gave it one hard push, and the ship's doctor fell on my shoulder. He was dead. My first uh, qualm was getting out of the diesel generator room, because there was only the one hatch in and out. No escape hatch was in the room and it had those six dogs on the thing that had to get open. Well, I opened that, threw the hatch open, and the whole forward end of the ship was on fire, and I knew I couldn't go that way. As I swung sideways, they went out and grabbed and pulled the hatch. I just pulled the hatch down, and the shell ran right in the middle, killed them all. To go around a corner, and there was a ladder going up to the next deck. I got around there, and of course they have the big hatch that they drop down and they secure it. In the center of it, there's a circular hatch that has a wheel and you'll spin that wheel and it's an escape hatch. You can get through this thing. I couldn't get it open and I sort of got pretty panicky. I went back into the diesel generator room and got a, sound, a, a flashlight, a battle lantern. Went back there and sure enough, I, they did fortunately have arrows pointing which way to open, and I was twisting it the wrong way. I spun it open, threw it a hatch up, and that put me up on the next deck. And it blew me off the ladder, and it just blew, I don't know what happened, but the ladder actually got blown away too. So I didn't know where I could climb up. From there you go straight, go aft, and there's another ladder that goes up and puts you on the main deck. However, this particular ladder was just full of bodies and body parts, and it, it was blocked. The forward fire room up through the ward room, it was blocked with the fire. And due to my service in the IC room, I really knew there was another escape hatch in the IC room. So I went back, and when I got the folks who was by then was on fire. There's the forward part of the ship there, the forward two parts all on fire. So there's a ladder up under gun one and a hatch about that big around. I climbed out, I turned the wheel, but the concussion when they took the hit there, for the, the forward the gun areas get hit, the housing get hit there, the treads must have stripped because I'm turning the wheel and there was three dogs, steel dogs about that wide, about that, about that long that makes it watertight, stand on the ladder there. I grabbed the wheel, the drill one, and I bent those dogs. While I'm trying to surmise what I'm going to do and everything, there was a shipmate, to this day I don't know who it was, but he was trying to bust a hole into the steel side, the bulkhead, trying to get out of the ship. He was, he was pretty panicky. I told him, follow me, mate. And we went into the deep IC room and went over to the one corner. And there was an escape hatch, threw it open, crawled through the body parts and stuff that were there to get to the main deck. And then I put me out on the main deck. And a shipmate passed me up and over the side he went. <laughs> to this day, I don't know who it was, but. Uh... I was back there on the stern and just after where I was, wasn't too far and they, they hit the smoke generators, which was phosphorus, you know. And uh, so I, I thought, well, enough of this. And so I went forward. They, and of course, he was scared. Now, I said, I think for every Hail Mary I said, I said an SOB. <laughs> so it was pretty well equal there. I was praying one moment and cussing the Japs 
the next moment. The fortunate few who managed to make it to the main deck could not believe the destruction that had been occurring above them. The beautiful ship that had been their home for over a year was now sitting dangerously low in the water and was being cut open by the intense shelling of the Japanese. Even more shocking was the sight of the human carnage. Standing there in shock, I uh, couldn't believe the way our beautiful ship was all shot to pieces because the stacks were bumped over, the torpedo tubes were hanging loose, and it had, we had really taken a beating because we took over 40 major caliber uh, shells that and she was about like this in the water then, and I hooked her on back half, couldn't see anybody anymore. So I come up topside and I looked over here and saw my buddy, uh, Penny Watch, and uh, my cook, blood running out of the nose, so I figured they were dead. I stepped over the life line and I was waiting for a wave to come up and meet me halfway, because that was a long way down. And, waiting for that, and it took a hit right in the handle room that I'd just come out of. And it blew me clear up over there. And even, I don't know, it just tore the rail and the lifeline down to, I hit the rail, hand rail around the gun mount, the rail and sort of like that there, and broke my ribs and I fell on the deck. This other guy, he wanted me to help him get the gig boat off. I said, no, I ain't, I ain't get fooling that boat. I'm going to get off of here. And I got the feeling uneasy about things, and so I went back to where that life raft was while it was gone. And then I looked around, and when well, she was going down by the stern, listening to port at a great rate, and the water was clear, just short of being amidships up on the port side. And when I woke, all of a sudden I said, see, something's burning, that was me. That deck was red hot. And I picked myself up in one jump. I didn't care, I was in the water. And I hit the water, and I, seemed, even with a life jacket off at that height, I went down a ways. The fellows up front were throwing guys over and helping them and trying to assist. Some of them, some of them didn't even want to be assisted, others tell me. And the ship at that point was lifting so bad that the, the lifeline on the port side was actually underwater. So I just waited off the ship. Well, I, I broad jumped. I wanted to get away as far from them as I could. A standing broad jump, you know, uh, right at the very stern. I seen an orange one. So I just jumped right in it. And I started swimming. So I thought, well, enough of this. And I took off my shoes and jumped overboard. And when I came back up and reached my pocket, got my pocket knife and I cut my boots off, kicked them away, and they hooked me on, I couldn't see them, I did All that concern, I just swam as hard as I could to get away from the ship. But then I looked and saw Bob Wilson, just against the uh, forecastle doors there, bouncing against the side of the ship there, and he said, help me, Miranda, and I'll buy you a bottle of good scotch. And so I went and got hold of him, and just got him away from the ship. The ship? Now listing heavily to the port and sitting very low in the stern, stayed afloat for nearly 30 more minutes before it slipped below the surface of the water. This did not stop the Japanese from continuing to rain down firepower upon the ship or the sailors who were now in the water. This ship was just shot. When I was in the water and looked back at her, she was just, she took a can open and just ripped her to pieces. The bridge, half the bridge was gone. Forward stack was blown away, you know, at that point. Number five gun was hit, and this barrel was down into the compartment below. Number four gun had the end of the barrel blown off. And number three, I believe, was shot off completely. And uh, it was uh, just torn to pieces. So I quit swimming, and I turned around and watched the ship, and it just <laughs> went down. Well, it wasn't too awful far from her when she just went down by the stern of the bow. It was high in the sky, and down she went. The, the, the fantail went down first. I, I, I go, and just, and, it, and when it went down, it just went straight down. I said, there goes our home, Bob, as she went on the ways there. It's kind of a sad feeling because, you know, it's your home. 
know, I mean, it, and you don't know what's coming next. They're still pounding shells into it. I hated that. Cause there's a lot of men still on that ship. And it's been my home for a year, two years. The chaos of the battle followed the men into the water as a life or death struggle quickly ensued. The less wounded survivors began instant care for their buddies. The ocean was now littered with bits and pieces of what was left of the proud U.S. destroyer. Just just going down, and three times we were blown up, eight inch shells landed right on us, exploded and blew us sky high there. And I got all torn up, my insides, I got, you see, in fact, a giant enema. It collapsed my stomach, coated my insides with oil, all the oils on the water, and the potassium bichromate is the dye they used in the shelves to mark the shelves. Okay, so that did. So there was a floater net uh, floating shortly distance from where I was. I swam over to that, got up on the floater net, and Pete McWalters and the shipmate, he was already there. So we just took command of this floater net. And when I got to the net there, Faulkner, the guy that came and talked, the whole Jeff Fleet was there. His arm was just hanging there. He said, take my arm off Miranda. And so I ripped his shirt, made a turn, I cut his arm off, and it held him in my arms. About five minutes, he died. And I said a prayer for him, and I pushed him away. And I took Wilson. I, I, I'd given Wilson to somebody. I don't know who it was to hold. So I put Wilson, I put his head on my shoulder and grabbed hold of that rope net. We're on there, a torpedo man, he came swimming up, asking for help, us to help him, and he, poor guy, had, had been shot, and he was, half of his intestines were hanging out in the front, and we knew it was pretty bad, so, and we couldn't get him up on the floater net, because the floater net, you can't get out of the water, your, your weight will hold it, it'll, it'll keep you afloat, but it's, you're still in the water about halfway. So we lashed him to the, we tied him to the floater net, the survivors quickly began looking for their shipmates as the currents off Samar pushed them away from each other. As this was occurring, many of the floating sailors found themselves directly in the path of several different Japanese ships. When I thought things were getting better, I heard a rumble sound the Japanese destroyer was bearing down on me at flank speed and I pushed Bob away and he hit me in the back, cartwheeled me. And it was a big ship that had three mounts on the forecastle head, you know, you know heavy cruisers. The stem of the destroyer just passed our floater net, and I was looking straight up at the bridge, at, uh, and pretty soon I'm underwater, and then, <laughs> then you're thinking, well, here come those screws, are gonna be chomp, 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 and they're gonna get chewed up pretty good. So we went underneath her and I was pushing up on that raft and holding her breath as long as she could. And then you come up. They told us when we went to school or whatever that the 50 caliber couldn't get you if you were two feet underwater. So during that time these guys were passing us and what have you, we, I, I was on the outside of the raft and we just push ourselves down hold herself underwater. So. Because they could have certainly, they could have killed me. Because we had an experience with an outrigger, where we uh, had, were carrying Marines and they finished the guys off in an outrigger. They never shot at us, but I, I heard machine gun fire, but as far as I know, they didn't ever shoot at us. And I swam up, I swam down, and I don't know, it's, it seemed like a Took me 20 minutes to get out of the, get back to the surface. I <clears throat> never did to see the screws come, and uh, pretty soon I bobbed up to the surface, and there was a ship had passed by. He wheeled down in the water, and that ship was high. It looked like they were looking right down on us. They was hollering and screaming, and waving their hands. I have a copy of uh, the magazine that that story appeared in telling about the fact that uh, uh, Admiral Corita had ordered his men not to shoot a single person in the water. Once the Japanese had passed through the survivors, the men were now faced with the reality of the situation. 
Each of the survivors, though confident that the rescue would come quickly, found themselves feeling very alone in the vast waters off the coast of Samar. It was rather peaceful, and I, and I felt safe, you know, although I, I really wasn't, uh, I don't know, maybe this is not the right term, I really wasn't smart enough to realize how much trouble we were still in because uh, I just thought that uh, we would eventually be picked up. There would be the question about that. But it didn't work that way. Quiet, eerie, and uh, you look and there's nothing, and you realize how big, realize how big that ocean is. You know, and you're, you're so, so insignificant to the one other individual there, and a, a group of us there, and is anybody going to come? Anybody come to help? And after it left, well, it's a pretty lonesome feeling out there. <laughs> Minutes gave way to hours as the survivors waited to be rescued. The men began to form larger and larger rafts to keep as many people as possible together and to create more space for the wounded to rest. Well, there were just, Pete and I were just on that thing. After the thing settled down a little more, maybe an hour or two later, because during this time, there were people all around, and we could see guys off in the, you know, a couple hundred yards or so. And then the, the planes finally came back from some of the carriers, although they didn't have bombs or stuff because they didn't have time to reload because we were surprised by this attack in the morning. And uh, they, but they were making dummy runs on the ships, uh, uh, some machine guns, to drive them off of us and distract them from us. So that helped. I, I estimate about 10 in the morning. I went in the water about 8:30 something like that. And here comes Bob to Spain. He guy screams like a fish. And uh, he said, "I'll take Wolves, and you swim alongside." And so finally, we saw on a crest of a wave, we saw a bunch of guys. A float nest. A broken one life raft was broken in half, and he tied it together, and two float nets, and we t they tied it all together there. Well, then we looked around and saw the group that were Captain Thomas and Captain Kentberger were on, and we hooked our arms and we pulled that floater net over towards that group, and rendezvoused with them, and tied them together. So we had three rafts and five floater nets all lashed together in a big mess out there, and they were. 38 in my particular group uh, on that uh, finally got all assembled together. 45 or 46 people on uh, the raft that I was on. One of the water tenders there came up there. When he got to the net, he's swimming there, and he reached out. I, I was reaching out to grab hold of him with one hand like that. He reached like that for my head and his skin from his arm. 660 pounds of steam in the boilers, and those guys, they were cooked. And I'll never forget, all the skin landed across my face, like that. And the, he just reached, just the hands reached, and I couldn't, he died, he died there. And we just float. You mean, in the daytime, you may see the island, and the nighttime, you wake up, and it's gone. Finally, we managed to make a, get a pyramid of the guys, and we found a little container there, opened it up, and there was some uh, malted milk tablets, some cigarettes. We managed to get a bit of pyramid, and I never got I smoked then. So, everybody taking a little puff of the cigarette there. Just give it, I don't get all wet to a wet hands. I stick it in my mouth, a wave hit me in the face. And one time they handed me their molten milk towel. You know about that big around, about that thick. That thing was about that big from wet hands. And they got handed that, and they looked in the face <laughs> to get. The first day in the water slipped away quietly and darkened into the night. As bad as things were during the day, they were that much worse at night. Night was also when the dead were buried. Well, at night it was the pits. You know, if you were above the water, then you got cold. And if you weren't on the raft, you couldn't hardly keep yourself underwater, you know. And so we were hanging on to one another and, you know, 
lay her head against the side of the raft. That was mostly on the second night. Or to say, yeah, that was during the night there, and, and sleep, and somebody generally looked after you so you didn't slump down and get too much water, you know. Cold. It was cold at night, and uh, you just uh, you just held on to the raft. Uh, those uh, the more seriously injured ones were put inside the rafts. And those of us who sustained just minor injuries, we just hung on to the, the rafts, the two rafts, and the half of a floater net. And uh, but, uh, your teeth get loose. I mean, you, you, you know, you stop your teeth for chattering so long, finally you just give up and it's just a little chatter. And, and then you keep trying to hold them back after a while, but your teeth, my teeth actually got all loose. But they tightened up in a few days, you know. They weren't ready to fall out. <laughs> For the two days that we were were on a raft, anybody that was seriously injured didn't make it. As it, they die off, why then you take the life jackets off them and, and turn them loose and say a prayer and they, they go down. Well, at night we would bury them. They, day in, they die in the daytime, and then, you know, the net had a big, deep place where you can stand in the water, about knee deep and more. But when they die, we just let them stay in there until night. Then we bury them at night, and just let them float away. Pretty bad. The dawn of the second day in the water came with no fanfare. No general quarters, as had been called for every day during the war. This day also brought no relief. Other than the occasional American planes flying overhead and dipping their wings, no sign of rescue was visible. Exhaustion became the real concern. Men became confused and delirious as their bodies suffered from exposure and lack of water. Planes would fly over later that day and wigwag us to let us know that we were, they know they were in the water, and okay. And uh, so we we felt any minute we were going to get rescued. Yeah, you're pretty kooky by the time the third day. Yeah. You're, you, everybody, uh, uh, you know, that night, the second night, you're you're having all kinds of crazy dreams. I I could just see the pearly, the gates of San Francisco all lit up, the whole city and the. <laughs> You know, everybody had different different dreams. We got people who were starting to get delirious, and uh, I was running in the movies on board the raft, just like I thought I was aboard ship. I was delirious, and uh, I don't know what the movie I was running, but I was doing that. Oh, people who were doing all kinds of goofy things. And man, I told those guys. I said, I started one time, almost to go Wilson. I said, Where are you going? I said, I'm going over there and get a drink at that bar. And so help me, just as, like I was in San Francisco. You could see the streets, everything, the bar. Second day, we got through that night. The second day, we figured, well, uh, <laughs> they're going to be here pretty soon, but they didn't show up the second day either. As the second day disappeared, the survivors began to question whether they would live to see another day. Their numbers had seriously dropped since the ship had sunk nearly a day and a half before. Some died from the mortal wounds they had received during the battle. For some, drifting away from their raft was easier than holding on to life. Others had to be tied to the raft so as not to disappear. The sailors took turns sleeping and held their shipmates' heads above the water. Uh, some of the guys give up, you know. And, uh, some of them swim off. And you try to tie some of them to keep them from swimming away. And one guy, I, I, I don't know his name, I think it was Story or something, I can't remember his name there. And he, the second, after the second, almost the second night there, he started panicking. He wanted out of the water, he tried to climb up and I pushed him away, push him away and he wouldn't, uh, and he was gonna drown Boat Wilson, I would have drowned then. I hit him. They right in the temple and I killed him. Boy, that, 
years, it just tore me up. I almost went through was insane taking the life of that, you know. If I had taken the life of an enemy, that'd be one thing, but one of my own shipmates. One guy I remember, he said, to, well, there's a fresh, fresh water lighter down here. All I have to do is blow the whistle and he'll come up and give us fresh water. And he'd stick his head under the water and blow as hard as he could with that whistle. And uh, cause they had the little police whistles were in that survivor's gear too. And, uh, but the fresh water never came up from down there, so. The third day dawned just like the previous day and still no relief in sight. Since the sinking of the ship, the survivors had formed four separate rafts, each not knowing the whereabouts of the others. The, that morning was the first time we saw, we saw a land on our raft. Uh, and it was the third day. And of course, everybody's thinking about, shall I swim to it or, you know? What are we going to do? Are we going to go with the group? And you start talking about what are you going to do for landing? Of course, you think it's it's closer. So then the de debate came along on whether uh, we'd hit the beach and run for the hills. Well, that was a farce because <laughs> we weren't going to be doing much running. And I wasn't going to hit the beach during the daytime. And I expressed that, that uh, yeah, if you got me in this mess, I'm going to try to get myself out of it. So. Uh, I'm going to wait till dark before I hit any uh, beach because we knew the Japanese still had the uh, island. There were at least, I think, two rafts of people that were never picked up and they perished at sea. And uh, I, for some reason, was fortunate enough to be on uh, the raft uh, that uh, was picked up. Uh, I don't think we would have made another day. The currents near the island of Samar caused the different rafts to drift far from where the ship went down, which hampered the naval rescue. But as the third morning turned to afternoon, a ship appeared on the horizon. What was it? Was it just another hallucination? Was it a Japanese ship coming to do them in? Or was it the long-awaited rescue? We'd see ships, but uh, holler and scream at them, and had some flares we'd shoot, but they didn't see us, I guess. A lot of planes would go over and dip the wings, but they never come back. If that was another, we had a, a Bill Murray, and he was a little, fairly short guy, and we'd hoist him. We had a yellow, uh, like canvas, it was bright yellow. And, and we'd hoist him up with two legs. We had two rafts, so we'd shove him up, and he'd wave this big yellow flag. And then somebody would say, it's Jack Pickens, and they'd pull him down again. And that went back, I don't know how many times he yanked him down and pushed him up. It was back to pull him apart. <laughs> and we saw the first of the rescue ships in the LCIs. They knew they were coming out to pick up survivors, so they had put uh, canvas tarps over the bow to get the guys out of the elements. And Hickman looked at it, and he had done quite a bit of South Pacific and Asiatic duty, and he said, I wouldn't get too excited. It looked like Japanese picket boats to me. <laughs> so then we were all trying to hide again. And <laughs> well, I, that's where I almost made my second mistake. Uh, I, I decided that if it were a Jap ship, I was not going aboard and I swam far enough away from the raft so that if it were, I could try to, uh, to get away. So pretty soon they come flipping up and they were our LCIs and we saw that American flag flashing and beautiful sight. When I saw the flag, uh, I saw the stars and stripes, why well, I suddenly realized that I was so far away, I was gonna have to swim like you wouldn't believe to get back to the ship, which I did. <laughs> Here comes an LCI, and to this day, I cried when I saw the American flag. It was tattered, ripped from the wind and all, and coming over the horizon. 
and I, I saw that flag there. What a sight to behold. Finally, after nearly 56 hours of exposure in the ocean, the remaining survivors were rescued. Because the rafts had drifted far apart from each other, the lucky few who were rescued had no idea beyond their own raft as to who had survived. Upon their rescue, the physical toll of the past two and a half days was very apparent. And I know when they got up to the, uh, yeah, and the first thing they did, get the badly wounded up. Yeah, and I was helping push Wilson up, and this one sailor there on the LCI reached over to help. No, no, you know, from the giant enemy, they got uh, no feeling from here down. I got up just stepping the gunnel there, and my boat legs were rubber. Bang! I went to the deck. <laughs> Two guys grabbed me, picked me up. They, the fact is, we couldn't climb aboard. You think you're in the water, you think you're, you're buoyant and strong, you know. But as soon as you tried to go up that Jacob ladder, you couldn't. And, and they're not very far out of the water, like four feet, like my guess. And they'd reach down one guy on each side and they'd pull you up and throw you on the deck. You know, and they'd pull you up and drag you over. And it was just like sardines, you just, just squirm all around. The next guy is coming over, and the next guy, you're just trying to get away from the other guy. And you don't have any strength. I felt good. I felt, physically, I felt pretty, pretty fair. Uh, God, they had little cargo nets over there, and they got the crewmen of the LCIs helped us aboard. And uh, I, they helped me aboard. I took two steps and fell flat on my face. I couldn't walk. <clears throat> All I had on was a pair of dungarees. I don't know what happened. I, I had a shoes, socks, t-shirt, and a dungaree shirt, and everything on when I waited off. But uh, somehow I lost them during that time. When I hit the deck, I fell flat on my face. My legs were gone. And, and, and I couldn't walk when I got there. I kind of crawled over to where there was a deck house and just sat there, leaned against it. And uh, they propped me up against the bulkhead. And a pharmacist mate came along and he had a bottle of Four, uh, four Roses whiskey. He says, here, mate, take a shot of this. You know, I took a shot of that whiskey and it, hmm, boy. <laughs> well, they pull you aboard that board ship, brought you up to the top side, give you a little alcohol, I guess it's thin your blood or warming or something. And about that time, the greatest, most delicious things I ever had in my life was a cup of hot tomato soup. Oh. <laughs> I just that relished that. I dragged it down. And on our raft, um, we got, they fed us split pea soup. And then on my particular ship, the LCI 341, it was a, 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 a vat of a tomato bisque soup. And it, the best soup I ever ate, and I still love it. And, uh, well, they, they fed us uh, something I thought I would never eat, pea soup. I, I thought, I, I, as a kid growing up, was one thing I thought I would never eat, that would be pea soup. But I found out it tasted pretty good. And plus they had cans of Wesson oil that would put all over our sunburn and stuff. When officer, I don't know who he was, was off of my, which one officer, was, we had an officer on our ship there. And I was there, you know, I was raised up as a Catholic there, and I'm saying this. Saint Hill Mary, thanking God for my safety. He reaches in his pocket, he pulls his rosary out and hands it to me. The men made it to Leyte, and their wounds were cared for on vessels such as the USS Comfort. They eventually made their way south to Hollandia, New Guinea, aboard LSTs. This time, their voyage was not under the same threat of the Japanese as it was when they were steaming north several weeks prior. After being cared for in Hollandia, those who were strong enough made their way back to the States aboard a converted cruise liner, the SS Lurline. The men of the USS Hull were now back in San Francisco, where the journey of the USS Hull began. The survivors were now faced with assimilating back into a life here in the States. 
Yet every day, they carried with them the full weight of what they had experienced. And when we got our first liberty, we went into San Francisco and right on the corner, I'll never forget this, Mark and Gary, and some guy comes down, and it must have been a Model A. We used to retard the sparks in those days, and it backfire. Well, that happened, and the three of us were climbed on each other's frame right there, and, and so that was my first indication that we're, how bad we were at shell shock. We felt, and then we turned around, and all the people look at us, and we felt stupid, you know. As a rule, I've been trapped by old deck. You know, I said, fire be in front of me, behind me, and under me, and I can't get out. I'm still to this day afraid of elevators. And as soon as I got to the hotel, the first thing I looked for was the exits. And I've well, still always been that way. And I went to the end of the lady as, as getting out of, come up the staircase. She said, Well, there's an elevator. I said, Lady, if you knew what happened to me in October 25, 1940, I can't stand it. I'm afraid of closed spaces. Years later, when I first went to work for a company, uh, they tested rockets. And they used to blow them up intentionally in the proving grounds, which was probably equivalent to two city blocks from us. Well, I, went, I didn't know this, you know. I'm, I'm running the lathe. And the next thing I know, I'm down underneath the lathe. The guy's in the sh shopper looking around at me like, and this is years later. Like, uh, what's the matter with you? So you, you don't get over it either. There are certain memories in life that are so important and monumental, they are etched in one's brain forever. To a World War II veteran, the surrender of the Japanese in 1945 is one of these events. To the battle-hardened survivors of the USS Hull, War's end meant that this leg of their journey, a journey that had begun years earlier, was now over. Oh yes, I, I remember that day, that day very, very well. And the first thing we did before we headed into town, downtown San Diego, we went to the Catholic Church down there below the hospital. Thank God for sparing us. Then we went to town and watched a big celebration. Boy, we went to celebrate, and, you know. And then uh, following, you know, Glenn Barkin was there. Well, then, then the following week, when it really was the J Day, uh, then we were at the same place celebrating. And I put on her uh, dad's pinstripe to suit, went to town, and my buddy put on it, and he was a captain in the. Merchant Marines, he put uh, Glenn Barkin put on the captain's uniform and went to town. <laughs> uh, it, that, was a, that was the greatest day of my life, I think. I mean, everybody was happy. You didn't find any, anybody sad. Yeah. We went out and got drunk. <laughs> uh, Sam Lucas, Bill Mercer, and a couple of other uh, guys, we found a car, had the keys in it, so we took the car and took a ride. And uh, we weren't uh, we weren't smart thieves. We brought the car back where we had stolen it, <laughs> and uh, and left it. And uh, uh, I guess whoever owned it didn't even miss it. Turning cars over, they were just wow. How are legacies defined? The survivors of the USS Hull have always faced the stigma of the fact that the battle for the Leyte Gulf is not as well known as some of the other major engagements during World War II. Yet many historians consider it to be a pivotal moment in the war's history. The screening fleet of Taffy III, those destroyers and the destroyer escorts, the tin cans of the Navy, performed an invaluable mission on that fateful October day. Their gallant efforts in the midst of the horrible carnage and chaos enabled the carriers to launch their planes and deter the advancing Japanese fleet, 
which paved the way for successful liberation of the Philippines. The men of the USS Hull today are dwindling in number. Some 20 remain of the original 80 or so survivors. And just like the rest of what has been called the greatest generation, they are losing men each year. The bond between these men is strong, forged in blood, sweat, and tears some 60 years ago. And these men have carried the memories of that horrific day and the memories of their fallen shipmates with them every day of their lives and will carry those memories with them to their graves. Forty-two years later, Bob retired as a school teacher in Tacoma. He and Louise arrived at my ranch here with a long-promised bottle of scotch. I'll never forget the ship and my, my shipmates, uh, those that didn't make it. They are they're always with me. The moment I open my eyes in the morning, I thank God every day for another life and for sparing me. And I think about my shipmates. So hopefully, uh, uh, the experiences that we had uh, will never have to be repeated. But considering the world we live in, I think uh, uh, just about anything uh, can happen and probably will happen.